Hi, my name is Connie Polanis and you're watching a video, Orbital Injuries, Clinical Characteristics. In this video, we will be focusing on orbital uh, blowout fractures and uh, the clinical characteristics and the clinical investigations we should undertake when a patient um, comes to our clinic or presents to clinic with a potential blowout fracture. So mechanical uh, restrictions can occur for a number of reasons when we have an orbital fracture, and some of these we've talked about already. We might have edema, for instance. However, we can also have um, tissue entrapment or a muscle entrapped within the fracture. The other thing that can occur is a flap tear, and uh, the image to the right here shows the rectus muscle here and the inferior rectus in this particular instance. We actually have a tear of uh, the the inferior rectus. Now what can happen here is that uh, adhesions can develop uh, either anteriorly or posteriorly dependent uh, on the situation and create a leash effect in which case you'll get a mechanical restriction. Also you can have displacement of the globe either enophthalmos, exophthalmos or um, a downward displacement of the globe in which case you'll, you'll get um, restricted eye movements or limited eye movements. So there are a number of reasons why um, the eye movements may be limited and uh, this will need to be explored or further investigated uh, and generally a, a CT scan is warranted to have a look at the at whether there is um, tissue prolapse or, or muscle entrapment etc. So patients with an orbital fracture um, will present with a known incident that's yeah, resulted in, in the fracture. So for example, they might um, come to emergency with a motor vehicle accident or an assault. Visual acuity must be checked uh, in all patients, as you do with, in every situation, but um, visual acuity can be reduced due to damage to the globe or the optic nerve. So it's important that you monitor visual acuity. You also want to observe, um, you want to observe facial symmetry, have a look at whether there's a high femur, subconjunctival hemorrhaging, and swelling and so forth. So you can see here the um, individual to the, the right there. We can clearly see the bruising. We can see clearly see uh, subconjunctival hemorrhaging and so forth. Okay, and these patients will require um, a CT scan. The CT scan is considered best for looking at, at, uh, at bony fractures and looking to see whether there's entrapment of muscles. Ocular movements, uh, generally a orbital fracture will cause limitation that's generalised. So we'll usually see all of elevation, for instance, be affected rather than uh, labour elevation alone. So either all of elevation and or depression or perhaps abduction or adduction as examples there. The, as you know, the versions will be equal to duction, so um, should you have a blowout fracture, check your ductions and they should be equal, you know, should there be a mechanical restriction. Now you can actually end up with uh, neurogenic pauses from an orbital trauma, so uh, this is where you need to keep this in mind as you investigate the patient. In terms of uh, mechanical restrictions, there won't be a muscle sequelae and the only signs of overactions are usually that related to the contralateral synergist. So with the HES chart, if we have a look here, um, we can see that we've got limited elevation across all three uh, areas. So here in terms of uh, LAVO elevation, direct elevation and dextro uh, elevation. And what we see is an overaction of these three, um, these three areas as well. You may also see restriction in opposing directions. This can occur, obviously, you can see it on the ocular movements or on the HES. Uh, in the HES chart here, we don't, we don't see this. We see limited elevation, but we're not seeing limited uh, depression. And uh, you will see narrowing of the fields. And we do see narrowing of the fields up here. Um, but we don't see the narrowing beneath because we don't actually have a limitation in the opposing direction in this particular example. Okay, obviously you'll look at the cover test and the prison cover test and measure um, in uh, the positions of gaze that warrant investigation. Uh, a thing to note about the deviation in prior position, which I mentioned before, is that the deviation in prior position may not be as large as the limitation that you're observing. This is often an indicator that the uh, deviation is mechanical rather than neurogenic. 
And again, when you measure the deviation, you may find reversal of height. Uh, diplopia chart, if you look at the diplopia chart, it's not, it doesn't look like a uh, neurogenic palsy. It doesn't behave on the basis of those principles of uh, neurogenic palsies. And uh, again, you may find reversal of images if that's, if that's occurred. The field of BSV uh, generally does not occur in, um, in tertiary positions, such as LAVO depression as an example. If we have a look at um, the field of BSV here, we can see that we've ended up with this restriction uh, vertically. So here we have restriction of elevation, restriction of depression, and so we've ended up with this area of BSV that's quite central and within prior position. Again, not characteristic of a neurogenic palsy. In terms of monocular functions, well, this will be dependent on, on the extent at which the the blowout fraction has caused um, limitation of movement. But should there be um, straight eyes in prior position, you may actually have binocular functions in, in that instance. So if we have a look at the, uh, the patient here or the area of BSV, this is an area of BSV where their uh, eyes are aligned. And obviously then we have um, diplopia in these other regions. So this patient in prior position, um, despite having a blowout fracture, actually would have BSV in primary position. In terms of IOP, um, intraocular pressure can increase the mechanical restrictions. So if you ask the patient to look into um, the area of limitation, you will see an increase in, in IOP. Uh, enophthalmos or exophthalmos can occur. In enophthalmos, usually you've had herniation of um, fat or muscle and um, the eye uh, can become quite enophthalmic. And if we see here, uh, the patient here, has significant enophthalmos of the right eye, uh, which has occurred from that prolapse of the fat and muscle. Exophthalmos will occur when there is um, significant swelling uh, of the tissue or the surrounding tissue and it's um, allowing the eye to protrude out. Pupils, um, always check pupils. You could end up with a possible traumatic medriasis in, in some instances. And visual fields are performed if you suspect optic nerve compression. Other things to look out for is pain. Uh, patients may complain of pain when they're looking towards the area of limitation, and this is being caused generally by the tissue being trapped. Uh, infraorbital anesthesia can also occur if you've had damage to the infraorbital nerve. Uh, the patient will have numbness, and um, the numbness is in the region that we can see in this particular image here. And as you're aware, um, force duction tests and force generation tests can be utilised to um, assist you in diagnosis. The force duction uh, should be positive where you have a patient with a mechanical restriction. The issue with the force duction is very early on when there's a lot of swelling, it can be unreliable. So often your force duction becomes more reliable about two weeks down from, or two weeks away from the initial time of injury or thereabouts. With a force generation test, sometimes you can have a paresis uh, from trauma, so um, this can assist you to distinguish whether uh, you have a paresis or not present. And one more thing I want to mention is the ocular cardiac reflex. Some of your patients um, may have this, and it's in response to um, traction of an extraocular muscle or compression of the eye. And the patient will have bradycardia, so a slowing down at the heart rate, they may feel uh, nauseous. They may have syncope, which is fainting, and uh, have a low blood pressure or hypotension. So um, should, these, uh, should your patient be complaining of these um, sort of symptoms, uh, you're looking at a patient who's got the oculocardic reflex um, post-orbital uh, fracture. And just finally, before we draw to a conclusion, I want to bring your attention to this table, which is um, in Rowe's uh, textbook. It's a nice um, differential diagnosis between a patient who has soft tissue injury, so um, this column here, versus a patient who has a fracture with tissue entrapment and the patient without tissue entrapment. I won't go through each of these individually, but in essence, the soft tissue injury, the limited eye movements that you see, um, are not really due to the sorts of mechanical restrictions um, that we're talking about uh, in other instances. So they don't respond to uh, FDT or they fail an FDT test in the sense that 
um, you won't find a mechanical restriction using FTT. They don't have increases in IOP. Uh, Enophthalmos um, doesn't um, occur with um, soft tissue injury, etc. So the soft tissue injury is the patient who won't actually give you what looks like a mechanical restriction. Okay, those with fracture and specifically um, those with tissue entrapment uh, will, will more so give you the signs of an ophthalmos positive force duction, globe retraction, etc. Okay, so we've discussed a variety of clinical investigations that you will perform uh, if you have a patient who's uh, had an orbital injury or trauma to the eye. And with these investigations, you should be able to work out if you have a mechanical restriction versus a, a neurogenic palsy. And obviously, uh, these patients will be scanned to assist you to determine if there are fractures, if there is prolapsed tissue, um, how many walls have been fractured, which walls, and so forth. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.